Well, hi everyone. Welcome back to Math 118. Um, today we're going to sort of start our study in Chapter 3, um, which is the study of polynomials. Um, and we've seen this definition at, at least once before. I'm going to jot it down, and in the next part we're going to explore it in a, in a little bit more depth. But a polynomial is a function that looks like this. It looks like a sub n, x to the n, plus a sub n minus 1, times x to the n minus 1, plus, we go all the way down to say a1x, plus a0. And as I said before, um, in the following lectures and then throughout next week, we're going to look at um, studying these sort of general order polynomials. Um, but today we're going to look at, at um, one specific order, right? Um, over the past couple of weeks, you know, we sort of very briefly dealt with, say, you know, some zero orders polynomial p sub zero, which just equals a zero, right? Where all of these, these a sub stuff, um, those are all constants, right? Those are real numbers. So that means that our graph of our a sub zero is just, well, it's the graph of a constant line, right? Like this is a flat line, nice and simple. Um, First degree polynomials, we took a look at, um, say, you know, p sub 1 of x. That's going to look like a1x plus a0, right? Looks suspiciously like the form mx plus b. And that, that, that makes sense, right? This is describing a line, just we're using a1 and a0 instead of m and b. So this guy, you know, maybe our line is going to look a little something like that. Today we're going to take a look at our second degree polynomials, um, which are called quadratics. So let's write down our definition here. So a quadratic function is a polynomial function of degree 2. And it has the form, and this will be no surprise to anyone, as the form f of x is ax squared plus bx plus c, and we say that a cannot equal 0, right? Because if a equals 0, then this term would drop and we'd be left with a linear function. And, and we looked at sort of graphing, you know, quadratic equations a bit earlier in, in the quarter. And, you know, these, these quadratics are by no means new to um, most, if not all of you, but we're going to take a look at just um, some of the analysis of them uh, before we move on to, you know, analyzing general polynomial functions. Now, as is often the case, we're often wanting to take these functions and produce a graph of the function. And this form, right, this, this you know, quadratic form, um, isn't always the most intuitive to graph, right? Um, we kind of looked at function transformations last week, and those are super easy to graph. You know, you take your parent graph and you just kind of shift it around a bit, and it gets you a graph of what you need. And what we're looking for is a way to do that with this, right? And it turns out, and we'll, we'll walk through a few examples of this, if you complete the square, okay, you can change your um, function into what's called standard form. So your normal, you know, quadratic function is going to look like this. ax squared plus bx plus c. And if we complete the square, we can turn it into something that looks like this. It's a times x minus h squared plus k, right? And if you expand this out, right, you can go back the other direction, which tells us that these two forms are equivalent. But the beautiful thing about this thing called the standard form is if you take a set of axes, right, well, I guess we'll need two, one for when a is positive, one for when a is negative. 
But if you take your set of axes, right, and you find the point, you know, say it's right here, say h comma k, right? Well, that is, that's where the origin gets mapped to on our polynomial, right? So if we pretend that there's a little origin right here on h comma k, well, then we can get our graph almost immediately because it's going to look like this, right? And that's where a is greater than zero. Similarly, if a is less than zero, once again, we can find our point h comma k, pretend there's a little mini axis system right around there, and then draw our parabola stretched or squished by a like that, right? This is the beauty of the standard form. Um, one piece of notation, this point right here is called the vertex, right? It is simply like the, the, the point from which our parabola sort of opens up. So let's do an example of this. Let's take f of x is 2x squared minus 12x plus 13. And let's see, what should we do? Let's express it in standard form. Um, let's find the vertex and the x and y intercepts. And then we'll sketch the graph and give the domain and range. So I think we might need a little bit more room than that left us with. So let's just go on to the next page and put it there. So starting with part A, we want to express this in standard form. So we have 2x squared minus 12x plus 13. I'm looking to complete the square, so I need to factor out our 2. So this becomes 2. Uh, times x squared minus 6x plus something that's going to add 13 uh, plus 2 times that same something. Well, negative 6 divided by 2 is negative 3. Negative 3 squared is 9. So that's what needs to go right there. And this is going to come down to 2 times it looks like x minus 3 squared should be 13, and then that should actually be a minus. So 13 minus 18 is a negative 5. So now we have our two points here, right? We have our vertex here. Um, so B, we have our vertex is going to be, it looks like, 3, negative 5, right? Because remember, we're doing minus H, but then plus K and the x and y intercepts. Well, it would seem to me that the y intercept can just be found right here, right? The, the y intercept is just 13. Don't know why this is in green, but I guess we're rolling with it. So our y intercept is 13. For our x intercept, why don't we just um, run to the quadratic formula? So negative b is going to be positive 12, plus or minus the square root, it's like 144 minus 4 times 26, which is going to be 104. And that's divided by 4. So it's looking to me like it's going to be 12 plus or minus the square root of 40 over 4. So I'm saying 12, and then I can pull a 4 out to get 2 times the square root of 10 over 4 or 6 plus or minus the square root of 10 over 2. So those are my two x-intercepts. 
So we're sketching this graph, which basically just means that we're, you know, drawing an approximate graph of our function and ensuring that all of the important pieces of information are labeled. And those pieces of information, in this case, I would say that the vertex and the x and y intercepts um, would be enough information, right? So our y-intercept is going to be up here at 13. Our two x-intercepts are going to be um, at 6 plus or minus the square root of 10 over 2. Um, I almost rarely ever use the like decimal approximation um, just because I don't think it's quite as helpful um, for us understanding what's actually going on. Um, but in this case, our two x-intercepts are about 1.42 and 4.58. Okay, so I can add those um, here. You know, say this is this is going to be six. This is going to be six minus the square root of ten over two, and this is going to be six plus plus the square root of ten over two. And then our vertex is going to be at 3, negative 5, so somewhere about in the middle and down a bit. And that's enough information to get a sketch of our function. Okay. And then the final thing is asking for the domain and range, which we can read off of our graph. Our domain looks like it's going to be the full real numbers, right? There's nowhere that this function should fail. And then our range, well, our vertex is located at 3, negative 5, and it opens upward. So that would say to me, like, our, um, our range should be negative 5 to infinity. So we mentioned last week um, that we care about the minimum and the maximum of these graphs, right? That um, the way that these graphs behave, where they're the tallest in a given area or the smallest in a given area, is important. And I also said that for most of the functions that we deal with, with the tools of pre-calculus, we don't quite have enough to find them. The main exception to that is actually these quadratic functions. Okay, if you take a quadratic in standard form, so for a function f of x is a, times x minus h squared plus k. The minimum or maximum value for f occurs at x equals h. Okay, this is this is really, really cool, right? Because um for these functions, we have the tools to find these, right? In the case where a is greater than zero, in the case where a is greater than zero, let's just kind of throw a little graph in the corner. When a is greater than zero, our parabola is going to open upward, which would mean that this point, the vertex, is the minimum of the function, right? So if a is less than zero, then the minimum value is f of h, and it's equal to k, right? But what if x is less than 0? Well, if x is less than 0, again, just kind of ske sketching a graph in the corner, if x is less than 0, then our parabola is going to be pointed downward, which would mean, which would mean that our vertex corresponds to the maximum. So if a is less than 0, then the maximum value is f of h equals k. So let's do a couple examples. OK, so, so for the given functions, Let's say let's um, let's say we, we want to express them in standard form. So 
sketch their graphs. And give their minimum or maximum values. So let's start with our first one. Let's say f of x is 5x squared minus 30x plus 49. Okay. So as I've said, we, we want to factor out this 5. So x squared, 30 over 5 is 6x plus something uh, that's going to be plus 49 minus 5 times something. That's something it looks to me like, once again, it's going to be 9. So it looks like that would come out to 5 times x minus 3 squared plus 49 minus 45. Looks like it's going to come out to plus 4. So sketching a graph of this really quick. Remember, we're interested in, in sketching a graph in, in this case, right? There are absolutely times on quizzes and homework where you will be expected to um, like graph with a little bit more detail than these sketches end up giving. But we're doing this in lecture, and the point of these is not to graph them, it's to get a handle on the other ideas. So we see the y-intercept is going to be 49 from this 49 right here. And we know a vertex is going to be 3, 4. Maybe we'll put that there. And I know that I don't even have to look for any x-intercepts, right? Because my vertex is here, which is above the x-axis. And my parabola opens upward, so there's no reason it would ever touch our x-axis. Okay, and so we have our vertex, we have our sketch, and we're looking for our minimum. Well, the minimum value for this function, it happens at 3, and it's equal to 4. One more for you. Let's say g of x is minus x squared plus x plus 2. Okay. Completing the square on this one is slightly more difficult just because we're dealing with fractions, which I know is, well, it's, it's not my favorite. Maybe you love fractions, but I certainly don't. So we have negative 1 here. Negative 1 over 2 is negative 1 half. Negative 1 half squared is 1 fourth. So it looks like our completed square is going to be x minus 1 half times a negative 1 squared plus, and it looks like 2 plus 1 fourth is going to be 9 fourths. Okay. We're sketching a graph. We'll need axes to sketch our graph. Maybe we'll make it look a little something like that. Sure. We know our y-intercept is going to be 2. If you're careful with the factoring of, of this guy, you're going to get x-intercepts of, let's say, minus 1 and 2. And our vertex is going to happen, I don't know, call it there, at 1 half, comma, 9 fourths. And filling in this detail with the graph. Definitely not my best parabola. But we'll call that good, right? It's a sketch. Since my value of A is um, less than zero, we're dealing with the maximum here. And our maximum happens at f of a half. Right? It, it, it happens at x equals 1 half. It happens, it happens at x equals 1 half, and the value is 9 over 4. And the next question that, you know, we sort of lend ourselves to asking is one we've asked a number of times throughout the quarter, and we absolutely won't stop, is what about the general case?
right? Can we find some form to solve the general quadratic for where its vertex is? Okay, so we'll need our quadratic. So f of x is ax squared plus bx plus c. Well, the first thing I know I need to do is I need to factor out my a, x squared, plus b over ax, plus something. And then we're adding to that c minus a times that same something. That something is going to be b over a divided by 2, so b over 2a, and then square it. That's going to be b squared over 4a squared, copying the same thing here. And the next thing we're going to get, um, we can simplify this inside now that it's a perfect square. We're going to get x plus b over 2a, and that's going to be plus c minus, looks like b squared over 4a, where that a and the a squared cancel. So, this is the general form from a, so, so what we've done here is we've taken our general quadratic and we've put it in standard form with our variables in terms of, you know, this original A, B, C. So that means so what we've said is that for a general quadratic function, the minimum or maximum, right, whether it's minimum or, or maximum will depend on the sign of A. But we know that that happens at, well, our, our x coordinate is going to be the negative of this since we're adding. So it's going to be negative B over 2A. And then C minus B squared over 4A. But what's worth noting here, actually, is that another way to write this, right, negative B over 2A, but I know that this point has to be on the graph of the function, right? So another way to write this, sometimes it's just a little bit easier, is that it happens at F of negative B over 2A, okay? So let's do some examples with this. Let's say, let's just say find the minimum or maximum of each function. And now that we have this beautiful formula, we can just use that, right? So let's start with, say, f of x is x squared plus 4x. We know that in this case we're looking for a minimum, right? And it's going to be at negative b over 2a and f of negative b over 2a. So, so looking at this, we can see that a equals 1, b equals 4, and c equals 0. So, that would mean that minus b over 2a would be minus 4 over 2 times 1, which is minus 2. Okay? So that would mean that our minimum will happen at f of minus 2. Well, that's minus 2 squared plus 4 times minus 2. So that's going to be 4 minus 8 or negative 4. So we have that the minimum of this function occurs at negative 2 and is equal to negative 4, right? And if you went and graphed this function, that's exactly what you would find. Let's do one more of these, right? Let's say g of x is minus 2x squared plus 4x minus 5. Identifying, we have a is negative 2, b is 4, 
C is negative 5. So our negative B over 2A looks like it's going to be negative 4 over 2 times negative 2. which is just going to be 1, and then f of 1 looks like it's going to be negative 2 plus 4 minus 5, which looks like to me that's going to come out to be negative 3. So my maximum, and remember we're looking for a maximum here because negative 2 is greater than 0, well our maximum is going to occur at 1 and be equal to negative 3. Okay, one last example for you. Okay, so, so say the fuel economy of your car, right, at a given speed, right? Some, somehow your, your manufacturer, when you got the car, um, posted on their website, like, hey, this is the function where if you input speed, it gives out your miles per gallon, right? So let's say that this function, right, miles per gallon as a function of speed. Say it's negative 1 over 28 times the speed squared plus 3 times the speed minus 31, right? Say that's what's governing it, right? Well, then how fast should you be driving, right? If you're trying to save money, how fast should you drive, right? And this is an instance where we're looking for the maximum of this function, right? We're trying to optimize, or in this case, maximize our output based on a given input. And this is a quadratic function, so we can totally do that, right? Our maximum is going to happen at negative b over 2a. Well, it looks like we have a is negative 1 over 28, b is 3, and C is negative 31, okay? So, so negative B over 2A. It looks like we're going to go negative 3 over 2, and then that 2 is times negative 1 over 28. Since I have a denominator in the denominator, I can bring it to the numerator, but that negative 1 is going to stay. 3 times 28 divided by 2 it looks like that's going to come out to 42 miles per hour, right? Or whatever this unit is. I'm assuming it's in miles per hour. And then what would the fuel efficiency of your car be, right? Well, that would be M of 42 miles per hour, right? So it's going to be negative 1 over 28 times 42 squared plus 3 times 42 minus 31. And if you plug this into your favorite calculator or work it out by hand, you're going to see that your fuel efficiency is going to come out to 32 miles per gallon, right? So you should drive 42 miles per hour for a maximum efficiency of 32 miles per gallon. Sweet. So that wraps up our look into quadratics. Uh, come to the next part to look at some general polynomials.